Hi everyone, this is part two of me going through section A questions. So we'll carry on from where we left off. So here we go, another past paper, another load of multiple choice questions. So if you have watch, watching this one, I haven't watched the other one. Um, I've gone through uh, the two papers already, I think, and this is uh, two more uh, different papers to go through these first sections. So let's go straight into the first question. Which one of the following is a technical textile? So brass is a metal, that's an alloy. So it's not that one. Graphene is what we would call a modern material and it's actually uh, carbon, stuff like that. Kevlar is what you would class as a technical textile. So it's stuff that can be used in bulletproof vests and it has that woven kind of like polymer uh, fibers to it and it gives it a lot of strength. So that is a technical textile. Whereas polyester is just a normal uh, textile. Why have I filled that in? So the correct answer for that one is Kevlar. Which term can mean the latest trends in clothing or decoration? Very easy question. Uh, belief, no. Um, culture, no. Faith, no. I would imagine it's fashion. Which one of the following has a positive impact on the environment? So this, these questions are really simple, but if you read them wrong, um, if you read it as negative impact or something like that, just make sure you read the question really carefully. So which one has a positive impact? Well, global warming doesn't have a positive impact. Inefficient working doesn't, and neither does pollution. So it's quite obviously reducing waste. I feel like there, they're trying to catch you out. So make sure you read it carefully. Aluminium is used in the manufacture of cooking pots. So straight away, we're thinking needs to be a good conductor of heat, needs to be quite malleable to be able to be shaped into the uh, shape of the pot, maybe needs to be corrosion resistant. Um, because it has which property? Well, we wouldn't want an absorbent pot that absorbs moisture. That would be dumb. You wouldn't want something really dense and heavy. Um, you wouldn't. Electrical conductivity is not needed. We want thermal conductivity to transfer the heat from the hob uh, to the food that is trying to be cooked. So it's thermal conductivity. Name the type of motion represented by the symbol below. So linear. Linear would look like just in a straight line. Oscillating is this basically. So oscillating is like a pendulum, kind of swinging back and forth. Reciprocating is just going back and forward or up and down in a straight line. So like someone punching or like, um, I don't know, what else could you do? Oh, like a piston in a car. There's loads of different examples. I can't think of any. And rotary is obviously going around in a circle like a wheel or something or a windmill. So this one is... Uh, oscillating. Right, which one statement about absorption is true? Uh, Kevlar suffers when it absorbs water. No, it doesn't. It's really resistant to all that sort of stuff. MDF, which is a manufactured board, expands when it absorbs water. Yes, it does. It can, uh, the water can get inside the wood and can cause it to kind of go nasty and, and um, kind of breakdown, which is not ideal. Nylon disintegrates when it absorbs water. Well, that's wrong because if you tried to wash nylon tights and they disintegrated, that wouldn't be ideal. And polypropylene changes color when it absorbs water. No, it doesn't. It's not a smart material. So the correct answer there is MDF. In business, a method of raising brand awareness by using websites and social media is called, well, it's not a cooperative because we know that that is a business owned by its workers. Um, innovation, no, not really. Um, it's using websites and social media, so it's virtual marketing because you are raising awareness, that's like advertising, so it's virtual marketing. Virtual retailing is similar, but it's where you're actually selling the product, so virtual marketing is the correct answer. A designer has been asked to create load-bearing furniture from card or board which is a bit of a confusing one. So um, identify the most suitable material for this project. Well, corrugated card, it can be very, very uh, strong depending on how it is orientated. In my degree, when I did product design, we had to make a chair out of cardboard as like our first uh, assignment. And actually, depending on how you fold card and how you um, kind of design it, 
it can be extremely strong. So corrugated card, because it has those, the kind of layers where it's got the top layer and then it's got these kind of flutes that go through the middle. And if you have quite a few of those laminated on top of each other, it makes it quite, um, quite good in compression. So it's corrugated card because the other ones, foil lined board is used for things like um, food packaging, inkjet card, oh, why have I filled it in again? Inkjet card is used in printers. And solid whiteboard is that stuff that's used for like posh, nice, high quality packaging for like electrical products or things you might buy in shops that have got nice packaging. So corrugated card. A smart material is one which conducts electricity. I guess one of them does. Shape memory alloy probably would. Protects against fire. No. Reacts to a stimulus. Yes. So they react to light. They react to water to electrical current, to heat, all sorts of things. Um, and no, they don't, they don't waterproof fabric. So that one is, reacts to a stimulus. Which one of the following is a manufactured board? That should be easy all day long because ash is a hardwood, balsa is a hardwood, spruce is a softwood, plywood is your manufactured board. Right, this one, especially for us product design specialist people is a bit of a tricky one. Give two reasons why blended and mixed fibres are used in clothing. So quite often materials are mixed together to give different properties. So one of the very common um, mixes of um, textiles is cotton being mixed with polyester. And sometimes it's like an 80-20, more polyester than cotton. The reason they're mixed together is that um, they the cotton can make the product easier to um, or more comfortable for the wearer because it's softer and the polyester can uh, make it it can make the product dry a lot quicker it can make it uh, a lot cheaper or more less expensive to produce because you're kind of bulking it out with something that's less expensive so for this I would say something like um, mix together to give desirable properties for example polyester is mixed with cotton to improve durability so durability could be one of the reasons and then i've kind of justified it with an example and you could say that natural fibers are mixed so natural fibers <coughs> are mixed in to make materials <coughs> more comfortable to wear because they're quite soft there's quite there's other reasons but those are two good uh, examples right explain the disadvantages of extracting fossil fuels as a source of energy so this should be relatively simple um, I'm going to bullet point this so they are finite so they are running out and are not a sustainable source. So that could be your first mark there. Second mark is you could say something like it's damaging to the environment. And what you might put is something like uh, drilling of oil. <clears throat> Or if you've got any other geography knowledge of like fracking or anything like that, I said fracking there, by the way, um, you could bring that in. But dr drilling of oil, damage to like seabeds and animal like habitats, that could get you a good mark there. And you could also say that the process of extraction uh, generates a lot of CO2 generated, which contributes to global warming. So. I think anyone, you all do science, I think that's quite a, a, a simple question. You could bring in geography knowledge there, you could bring in science knowledge, and it's a relatively easy question to answer. Right, the next one is a maths question. So it says, toy trains like the one in figure two are to be painted. How exciting. Paint is purchased in tins that can cover four square metres, so that's quite important. So four square metres can be covered. Table one shows the amount of paint in each colour required to paint one train. So this is for one train. Now, the question here is asking us to consider a batch of 50. 
calculate the total number of green paint that needs to be purchased. So the first thing we need to do is we need to do 0 0.45 times 50 because that's how many we need for one and we need 50. So I'm no whiz with math, so I'm going to put that in my calculator. 0 0.45 times 50 is equal to 22.5. Now, we know that four, each can can um, cover four square meters. So what we're going to do is divide that by four. And the answer we get is 5.625. Now, if you put that, you would not get a mark. You'd get the mark for working it out, but that means you need six cans because you can't buy five and a bit cans. You need to buy six so that you've got enough. So six is the correct answer for that one. Next one. What percentage of green paint will go to waste? Calculate your answer to two decimal places. Right, so what we need to do here is we need to do six minus 5.625 to work out how much paint is left basically uh, in that. So if we do that, we do six minus 5.625 six two five that gives us 0.375 so that's how much of the paint is left over we need to now work that out as a percentage so what we need to do is this is the imagine that's the hundred percent so we need to divide it by six and then times it by a hundred to get the percentage so we divide by six and we times by a hundred I'm looking to the side because I'm using my calculator and that gives us an answer of 6.25%. Always pay really close attention to what they want the answer as. Two decimal places. And this one was trying to catch you out because really it's asking you for like how many whole tins you would need to buy. So make sure that you think carefully about what um, kind of how you need to give the answer to get the full marks. Right, another um, section A section. So starting off with the multiple choice again. This was actually last year's paper. And this is interesting because this caught out a few people, um, especially with this first question. <coughs> Conduct conductive textiles. So this is in the technical textiles bit. Um, they can be used to uh, burn at high temperatures. I like to think that you wouldn't think that something that's conductive could burn at high temperatures. Change colour mm, could potentially illuminate light emitting diodes, which is an LED. That's what that is. So already conductive LED, that kind of makes sense to me. Or to resist bullets. Well, it's not that one, is it? So conductive textiles basically is conductive thread that can be sewn into clothing that can carry a small electrical current to power wearable electronics like, for example, lights. Um, so if you're cycling, you could have lighting on your uh, clothing to make you more obvious in the dark. Or um, sometimes clothing have like um, volume up, volume down uh, on the clothing for like devices. So that's what conductive textiles are sometimes used for. But it's this one. Conduct, uh, illuminate the light emitting diodes. And the second question really tripped them up as well. Micro encapsulation is used to make fabric. That's two textile -y things back to back as the first two questions. So micro encapsulation is where a fabric has um, almost like a chemical or something impregnated in the actual fabric. So it can be antibacterial. So, for example, things like hospital bed sheets can have antibacterial um, kind of chemicals in them to automatically fight off any bugs that might be present on the surface. So micro encapsulation is used to make fabric uh, antibacterial, conductive, no, fireproof, no, stronger. So it's antibacterial. So, for example, micro encapsulation can be used on socks to stop them like building up a smell. But um, it's sometimes also used, um, like I said, well, it's always it, it, the main use is for it to have that antibacterial sort of uh, property. So those two last year really uh, upset my class because they were quite obscure bits from the first part of uh, like the core section. Right, a malleable material is one that uh, A, can be pressed into a shape or form, is able to withstand scratches and indents, that's hardness, so it's not that one. 
is hard to break or snap. That's toughness. So it's not that one. Rust with exposure to air and moisture. This is almost a repeated question from one that was um, earlier. That one's like corrosion resistant or whatever, or not, um, not corrosion resistant, but it's, it's A. So something that's malleable can be like hammered and squashed into a shape like copper or gold or silver, something like that. Right. When using marker pens, students find that ink stains other pages. Oh, how tragic. You can go through on your tables as well. Which term should be looked for when selecting the paper to avoid this? It's the ob most obvious thing in the world, bleed proof, so that the ink does not go through the paper uh, and is kept on the surface. So you can buy bleed proof paper for markers that stops that happening. It's expensive, that's why we don't have it. Which component is the output in a temperature warning system? So a lamp is an output. Output in a temperature warning system. Yeah, okay, that caught me off there. I was trying to work out, is it an output or an input? Okay, so a lamp is an output. So let's we see which ones these are first. A microcontroller is like the thing that's used to process it. A switch is an input and a temperature sensor is an input. So the answer must be a lamp. So a lamp or a light must come on when the temperature is getting too high in a system. Like in a car, when your temperature gets too high, a little light would come on. Right, next one. Which one of the following is ferrous? Now, ferrous means it contains iron. Bosh, there is iron. So the right question is, uh, the right answer is iron, because all of these other ones are non-ferrous, meaning they don't contain iron, they are non-magnetic, um, and they do not rust. Now, it's relatively easy to remember which ones are ferrous, because you literally only have iron and different types of steel, low carbon steel, high carbon steel, uh, high speed steel, it's literally steel and iron. That's the only types of ferrous metals. Right, identify the material shown in figure one. If you can't get that, something's gone wrong. It's plywood, you can see the layers. Um, MDF is the only other manufactured board. Oh no, it's not. Chipboard is a manufactured board. And balsa is the little tricky, sneaky hardwood there that actually is quite a soft uh, material and can sometimes, you would think it's a softwood, but it's actually a hardwood because it comes from a deciduous tree. Which one of the following is a renewable resource? Well, metal ore is not renewable, it's running out. Natural gas is running out. Oil is running out. So water is your renewable source there. A tough material is described as one that can bend and then return to its original shape. Well, that's something is elastic. Be pulled or stretched along its strength. That's ductility. Remember the... Uh, the duck with the stretch neck is shaped by pressing that's uh, malleability um, so withstands impacts without breaking that's the right answer that's what toughness is there which one of the following statements is true continuous improvement is the concept of storing waste no it's not lean working reduces efficiency that's wrong it increases efficiency Global warming is due to decreasing levels of carbon dioxide. No. And pollution is created by the burning of fossil fuels. Such an easy question, it's almost laughable, but just make sure that you read the question carefully. Right, so I think I gave this to you in your year 11 mock. So uh, in the textbook, there are some specific materials that are listed as modern. So things like uh, graphene, Oops, spelt it wrong. So things like graphene is a, mo a modern material. LCD screens are modern. Um, what else is modern? Titanium, I think, is, is counted as being modern. So there are a range of different materials that are counted as being modern. So don't just randomly name a material. Make sure that you think back to those materials that are on that particular uh, page. Carbon nanotubes are also on there, I think. So you've, you're the, the question here, oh, metal foam's another one as well. I like metal foam, that's quite cool. So it says, name one specific modern material. So say we went with metal foam. And then it's asking you why the use of this modern material improves the function of products. So metal foam, uh, I'm just going to put MF for the moment. Actually, no, that makes it sound like something else. Uh, metal foam is used in... Um, Things like armour and 
and uh, space space travel because it has excellent strength. I'm just going to bullet point now. It has excellent strength, fantastic strength to weight ratio. It has excellent. Um, it's it's really really lightweight, which is kind of what I've already said there. But make a big deal about that. Um, it's good in compression. And it means that um, things can be made a lot smaller and less use of uh, expensive materials. So, for example, uh, on the outside of a tank, I might be talking a little rubbish now, but on the outside of a tank, this is a tank, there's the gun, here's the tracks. Go with me, guys. Uh, imagine that you had some metal plating here that you wanted for armour. If that was metal foam, that could be just one piece that would help to protect from incoming um, bullets or whatever. To get the same effect with solid steel, you would you would need to put really thick chunks on the front, which could make it much slower, much heavier, more difficult to manoeuvre, all that sort of stuff. So obviously there's other, there's other reasons for the other answers. Um, graphene conducts electricity really, really well on really thin... Um, a th like a single layer of carbon so you can have like flexible phone screens and wearable electronics really lightweight uh, titanium has all the benefits of um, almost like aluminium where it's very very durable malleable but very very strong good for things like um, aerospace and uh, like plane components all that sort of stuff hip um, replacements are made using titanium doesn't rust so um, that one's a, a good one to go over because it's asking you very specifically about a modern material and if you don't know one you're stuffed right here we go high density polyethylene hdpe is widely used in the manufacture of household bottles and containers two detailed reasons why hdpe high density polyethylene is suitable for this type of packaging so we did some revision of plastics before the end of term Hopefully you remember that one of the key things about HDPE is that it, it is chemical resistant. So that's going to be really good if it comes into contact with things like bleach and cleaning um, chemicals. It's going to be resistant to that. So that's the main thing about HDPE. Now with anything that you get asked about polymers, there's some simple things that you can say about all of them that you can get you marks. A top one is that it can be pigmented. So it's quite, you can see that the, the, the picture, there's a green, there's a purple, there's white, there's a silver. So it can be pigmented to um, like match the branding of the product. So that's a really good one to talk about. You could say this goes for most thermoplastic. So HTP is a thermoplastic which can be heated and reheated. It can be recycled. So that's suitable because it is a single use uh, packaging. You could say that because it's a thermoplastic, it can be blow molded, which means it's suitable for mass production. And another thing that you could say is that it's lightweight, meaning it's not adding to um, transport costs. OK, so. Any of those ones would get you the, the full marks there. Right, study the diagram of the mechanism for car windscreen wipers in figure two. So we've got a motor with some rotary and then this is going to be going kind of back and forth, but on kind of like a pivot, kind of like this kind of motion. So the motion that it is going through is oscillating because it's kind of going from like like that. So it's like windscreen wipers, so it's kind of going like this. Whoop, 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 whoop. Explain the function of the connecting hinge. So these are connected together. Now, if you didn't have that connecting hinge, they might start like going in different directions and they could hit each other potentially. So it's two marks here, so I'm gonna bullet point it. You could say something like, stop the wipers from colliding. You'd obviously write it in a slightly more succinct way and you could also say to keep them parallel 
Oh, I can't spell parallel. I probably too many R's or too many L's. But to keep them parallel and moving in sync is another thing that you could put as well. Okay, so be ready to have questions about mechanisms um, in the exam and make sure you can identify them um, and be able to spot the changes in motion as well is quite important. Right, this is the final section A that I'm going to go through. This is from a practice paper that's in the back of a revision guide. So here we go. You might recognize some of this from the mark. So you have cut a piece of material to a measurement of 50 by 200 millimeters. The tolerance, tolerance is a very important word. It is the acceptable range of error that something can, um, uh, you can have on a component to mean that it's kind of met quality control. So for example, this uh, pen nib, the nib on this pen, the like end bit here, for that to fit into the barrel of the pen, it would have to have um, a small tolerance. It could be maybe plus or minus 0.02 millimeters or something. Um, if it's slightly smaller, slightly bigger, that's fine. But if it goes outside of that, then it will no, no longer fit. That's why tolerances are so important. So tolerances are normally shown as a plus or a minus uh, like this, and it will give you a certain amount. They've been really kind to you here and given you one millimeter. So that means that this thing can be 51 by 201 or it can be 49 by 199. That's the range that we're working towards. So already you can see that this one is smaller on one of the measurements. OK, so that one is not suitable. This one, you can see it's bigger here already. So that one cannot be right either. This one is within tolerance here and within uh, within tolerance here as well. So that one's looking like the right answer at the moment. This one, 50.3, so that's within, but 201.5 is not, so that's the correct answer. So watch out for questions about tolerance. They are usually quite simple, but again, if you don't think about them carefully, they can cause you problems. And I would recommend writing out the, the maximum and the minimum for the, each of the numbers. It helps you just to work through it. Right, which one of the following is a thermosetting polymer? Melamine formaldehyde. Well, that's a slightly strange, odd uh, name. So already that's making me think that that might be a thermosetting polymer. Polypropylene is a thermoplastic used for plastic chairs, Blu-ray cases, good fatigue resistance. Polyvinyl chloride, PVC, is fle can be flexible, can be rigid, used for window frames or garden hoses. Acrylic sometimes called PMMA, um, is good at uh, letting light through. It finishes nicely, used for things like signs. So melamine formaldehyde is the correct answer. It is used for work surfaces in kitchens and it's normally put on top of a manufactured board like chipboard. Which of the following properties means a material's resistance to abrasion, wear and scratches? Notice again, we've got another material properties question here. It's not absorbency. That's how something absorbs moisture or water. It's not toughness. That's how something um, can take an impact. It's not going to snap or break. Hardness means a material's resistance to abrasion or scratches. So that's the correct answer because malleability is its ability to be hammered into or pressed into a shape. Right, don't like this one. Another maths one. So this one is about gear tra trains and it's relatively simple, but um, you kind of need to know what you're doing with it. So it says a gear train similar to the one shown, the large gear has 36 teeth and the small gear has 12 teeth. So we've kind of got like a ratio, it's called a gear ratio. If the large gear turns at a rate of 30 revolutions per minute RPM, what will the rate of rotation of the small gear be? So it's going to be faster. OK, we know that already because it has less teeth. So the 36 teeth is going to make the smaller gear go quicker. So the first thing we need to do is work out the ratio. So the first thing that you do is you go 36 divided by 12 and we work out the ratio. So 36 divided by 12 is a very simple calculation. I realize I've just used a calculator for that and I'm embarrassed. It's three. Mm -hmm. Um, so basically the, um, 
the, the large gear is uh, at 30, that means the smaller gear, the speed is going to be three times more. So 30 times three is 90 RPM. Right, this one is a scaling question, which could catch you out, but um, it, it's not too tricky when I, hopefully I'll explain it to you. So an orthographic projection, so you all did orthographic drawings in your uh, NEAs. It's where you see, you see the, the front, the top plan or the side. And obviously if you're drawing something like a building or a boat or something like that, you can't draw it to scale. So you have to use a scaling factor. So it might be half size or quarter size or something like that. So it's asking you basically um, half, it's got half size there. So if the length of the part on the drawing is 20, what is the length of the actual part? So if it's 20 on the drawing, that means it's half on the drawing. So the actual answer is 40 millimeters because it would be double the size in real life. OK. Right. Which one of the following is a renewable energy source? Easy again, but just make sure that you read it correctly. So which one of the following is a renewable energy source? Well, coal's not. Gas is not. Nuclear is efficient, but it's not because it's using um, things that are running out like uranium and things like that. So wind is your correct answer there. Products are sometimes designed as a result of market forces. What is this known as? If it's anything to do with market, it's market pull. If it's anything like tech, like developments in materials or manufacturing methods, that would be technology push. So it's market pull. Market pull, technology push. Make sure you know the difference. Which of the following statements best describes the term fair trade? You will know this from like key stage three geography, maybe some science. So a business jointly owned and run by its members. No, nope, that's a cooperative. A method of marketing and selling a product. No, a method of raising funding and awareness for a project. That's almost like, uh, what's it called? Ah, oh, it's completely gone out of my head. Uh, like when you do like a startup, like a Kickstarter. Um, it's D, isn't it? A way of ensuring producers of products get a fair deal. A company has designed a product to fail within five years. What is this called? This has come up in previous um, questions. It's called planned obsolescence. When you plan something to fail after a certain amount of time, it's called planned obsolescence. Ah, it's there, crowdfunding. Crowdfunding, that is that, I think. Which of the following is the use of computers to support designing? Okay, well, there's only one D there. It's CAD, isn't it? Computer-aided design. The other ones, just so you're aware, Computer-aided manufacturing, flexible manufacturing systems, and just-in-time manufacturing. Now, flexible manufacturing systems are pieces of machinery that you can um, use to make lots of different types of products. So everything that we have in the workshop or in school is flexible because the laser cutter, for example, is not designed like an injection molding machine to just make one product. You can upload another CAD file and very easily make lots of different things. That if something a flexible manufacturing system, it means you can change what you're doing quite easily. Right. Uh, last page. So this is the last bit on this um, section A that I'm going to do. So it says name a smart material. You've got some options here. You've got shape memory alloy. That would be a good one. Um, sometimes called nitinol or nitinol, mixture of nickel and um, titanium. So you could do that, SMA, shape memory alloy. You could do um, thermochromic. You could do photochromic. You could do hydrochromic. So it's going to be one of those. I would go with one of the um, pigments or shape memory alloy. It's asking you to describe the property, but it's also asking you to give an application. So make sure you know an application before you start talking about any of these. So I'm going to go for shape memory uh, alloy. Describe the smart property of this material. Well, um, it can be heated and returned back to an original shape. So it has a memory. So that's its kind of smart uh, property. Give a typical application for this material, um, braces, 
are made using shape memory alloy also um, glasses frames frames on glasses are made from shape memory alloy um, if I was going to do that for thermochromic pigment you could say um, this material reacts to heat and can change color um, gives a typical application it could be like color changing mugs or a color changing spoon for a baby um, it could be a um, also like the battery detectors on batteries when you press the the two points on a battery to see how much uh, charge is left that's thermochromic so yeah the those are the ones I would go with state the stage in an electronic system where each of the following would usually be found so this is systems again this seems to be coming up quite a lot so a buzzer making a sound that is an output because that's at the end a sensor detecting a change in light level that's an input because that is what might trigger a speaker or a buzzer or a light okay so output input give two disadvantages of using non-renewable energy sources quite simple again two disadvantages of using non they are finite they're running out this is very similar to a question earlier so I'm not going to go over this too much they can um, cause uh, CO2, um, which is uh, con contributing to uh, global warming. Also, it can cause issues with uh, habitats, habitats being destroyed. So there you go. Two disadvantages of using non-renewable energy sources. Last question we're going to go through, give two advantages of selecting rechargeable batteries instead of non-rechargeable batteries to power products. They can be recharged, so it's less wasteful. Can be recharged, uh, less wasteful. Um, they're good in, like, if you were using them remotely, you could charge them up. Um remotely if you were like nowhere near a shop or something you could still charge them so they could be good in emergency I guess um, I can't think of anything else for that it's quite a strange question that one right so that is now me having gone through all of the section a questions that I could find if you're still with me well done but did you notice how many times material properties came up you may have noticed how many times things like uh, systems in electronic uh, things come up, like outputs and inputs, uh, mechanisms come up. The material stuff, I, I hope that you could kind of give a good guess and all the sustainability stuff is relatively simple. So it's just about reading the questions really carefully. Right, I hope that was uh, really useful. I'm also now gonna do a video about section B, but Maybe go through this, see what sticks out to you as something that you're not sure about, and then you can go back into your revision or watch one of my other videos to help you. Right, see you on the next video.